Thank you very much, and now you get to see me be more nervous than the other presenters. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this morning to present on behalf of my colleagues in, in MSF and in the Uzbekistan Ministry of Health. I'm going to be talking today about multidrug resistant TB, resistance to the two best uh, first line drugs that we use to cure TB normally in six months. And up until recently, that conventional care has taken more than 20 months of treatment according to international guidelines, with eight months of daily painful injections, treatment that causes many side effects with in some countries up to one third of cured patients going deaf, not to mention 10% having a risk of psychosis, risk of kidney failure, and many, many other side effects. This is very difficult to take treatment and at the end of it all, we hear the reports from WHO, 52% success rate. And more than a half a million people are getting, acquiring multidrug resistant TB every year. So it's on that background that MSF and the Uzbekistan Ministry of Health thought, can we do something different? And we actually took some evidence from this region and tried to apply it in Central Asia. For those who don't know, Uzbekistan is one of the 30 high burden multidrug resistant TB countries. And it has rates of 23% of um, MDR TB amongst new cases who've never had tuberculosis before, with high rates of second line drug resistance um, as shown here. And for those who are interested, Cat G mutation is more than 90% of cases of MDR TB. What I'm gonna to talk to you today is very briefly about uh, Two, uh, two studies that we've conducted, looking at testing for an association between comparing uh, the shorter MDR-TB treatment regimen with conventional care. And we're going to be looking at two-month culture conversion status as an interim outcome to look for any differences, and also comparing the two groups at 20 to 24 months. The shorter regimen is 9 to 11 months. It was first done in Bangladesh and has reported success rates of more than 80%. And now in subgroups of MDR-TB, it's advised by WHO as, as policy as one of the regimens that can be used. And data from this study and from several other studies was included in a meta-analysis to inform WHO policy. But this is really the first actual direct comparison um, of this regimen with conventional care. So the shorter MDR-TB regimen was a single arm prospective study that we set up in three districts in uh, Karakalpakstan, Uzbekistan. And we started recruitment in September 2013. I've put the WHO uh, abbreviations, but um, just to make sure we're all on the same page, this is four to six months of high dose isoniazid, pyrazinamide, ethambutol, Capriomycin, or if sensitivity to canamycin was shown, then we used canamycin, which is the injectable agent. Moxifloxacin at 400 milligrams, so standard dosing. Protheonamide and clofazamine for the intensive phase. And in the continuation phase, five months of five drugs, pyrazinamide, ethambutol, moxifloxacin, protheonamide and clofazamine. So a slight difference to a modification from the Bangladesh regimen with moxifloxacin at standard dose, protheonamide throughout the whole treatment. The inclusion criteria in this single arm study was pulmonary multidrug resistant TB and the exclusion criteria was a history of treatment with uh, second line drugs for more than one month or confirmed greater resistance either to fluoroquinolones or to both injectables, canamycin and capriomycin, or extensively drug-resistant TB. Now we did a single arm study, and it's after the fact of doing the study that we decided to do a comparison. So keep that in mind for the limitations. But basically, what we were able to do, because within the same program, we had another 13 districts where we were using WHO guidelines with conventional care. So we've done a comparison of the patients treated with the short course regimen in the three districts versus patients from a retrospective database using the same inclusion exclusion criteria who were treated with the conventional treatment of 20 plus months during the same time period in the program. 
And we're looking at the outcomes, as I mentioned, two-month sputum culture conversion, which is defined as two uh, negative cultures more than 30 days apart. And for final outcomes, for the conventional care group, we use WHO standard definitions at the end of treatment, which is usually between 20 to 24 months. And for the short course regimen, we used those who, um, we evaluated them 12 months after they'd finished treatment. So after the nine to 11 months, 12 months means 21 to 23 months after starting treatment. So this is the baseline characteristics. And uh, what you can see, I'll point out, the, there's a lot of uh, numbers here. That the key points are that in the conventional care group, we had 230 patients, and in the shorter regimen, we had 102 to compare. And mostly they were equally matched. There was no s statistically significant differences, but you will keep in mind that the conventional care group had a higher proportion with 43% having low body mass index compared with the shorter course regimen, only 33%. There were no HIV co-infected patients in either group, which is consistent with this program and the area in Uzbekistan where rates of HIV are incredibly low. In terms of the baseline characteristics, a, a slightly more around half of patients had cavities on their chest X-ray at baseline in the conventional care group. Baseline sputum smears were similar between the two groups, um, and baseline resistance to canamycin was also uh, similar, about approximately a third in each group. So what we did was uh, an analysis uni using univariate and then multivariate logistic regression, and what I'm going to present is the multivariate logistic regression. There's a lot of numbers here, and the key point about a multivariate logistic regression is we're trying to answer the question, when we account for the other likely confounders, how did the short course regimen compare with the conventional care? So I've highlighted on this slide, looking at the two-month culture conversion, that actually at two months, after adjusting for the other key factors, the there was a nearly two-fold increased odds of having converted, having a negative culture. So this means that two months on, on this measure, the patients in the shorter course regimen are doing better um, overall than the conventional care arm as a group. The, the model that we've used is a forward stepwise model, including parameters um, that we decided a priori, which is age and gender, and any factor which caused more than 10% uh, difference in the adjusted odds ratio. Secondly, when we come to the final outcomes, and I would say that this is still preliminary data because some of the patients we're waiting for their final microbiological outcomes. But we have used a conservative approach whereby if patients don't have their final outcomes, then we've excluded them from the analysis at the moment. In this comparison, adjusting for other factors including cavities on x-ray, the adjusted odds ratio, there was no significant difference between the shorter MDR-TB regimen arm and the conventional care arm. So as I mentioned, there are some limitations. So this is a non-randomized study, so there may be unmeasured confounders that could account for some of these results. However, we do think there's value in the fact that this was both districts within the same program, same guidelines, similar support for patients, um, and similar training, same models of care. So in conclusion, in this analysis, the, the shorter MDR-TB regimen showed higher culture conversion by two months uh, when adjusting for other measured co uh, co confounders. And there were similar final outcomes despite significantly uh, shorter treatment. So what does that mean? It means for this subgroup of patients, actually instead of giving them nearly two years of treatment, we can achieve similar results at two years, but they only take treatment for nine to 11 months. Can you imagine being a patient and only having to take half the treatment time? That's quite incredible, and I think this gives further strength to the WHO recommendations about use of this regimen. 
This is in a particular context with high background rates of second-line drug resistance, but I think this is relevant uh, evidence to this region in Southern Asia, which also has high rates of second-line drug resistance in MDR-TB cases. There may be relevance in the findings to transmissibility, and certainly for programs that use culture conversion as a discharge criteria from hospitalisation, that may be a benefit to patients. Although, as MSF, I would say, we are in our programs pushing for starting treatment ambulatory from day one, which was done in this study. Um, we also must, I think, wait for the randomised control trial, the STREAM study, which should have results out next year, which will answer many of the questions I'm sure you're going to ask me, and I can only answer partially today. So thank you to my colleagues, to the staff in Uzbekistan and the patients. Yes, yes, please. First and then second. What has happened to the mic now suddenly? They were all working. No, 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 please. I'll okay. prefer you use mic. Uh, ah. So, my name is Yogesh. Uh, I'm an epidemiologist in Manipur project. Can you speak a little louder, please? Uh, I'm Yogesh, uh, epidemiologist in MSF Manipur project. My question is, have you considered analysis like previous treatment in the analysis part? So, and is there any, you using moxifloxacin, so have you see any QT interval prolongations because it's high dose of moxifloxacin is, so, and uh, you, by your thing, I understood that there is a lot of conversion in the shorter human earlier, but have you have come across any sputum reversion? Okay, excellent question. So, um, three questions in there. I'll try and answer them all. And bear in mind that since the organizers kindly asked me to present two studies in the time of one, I haven't gone through everything. In terms of measured confounders, we did look at past treatment, diabetes, HIV, age, gender, uh, particular resistance patterns to canamycin, pyrazinamide, um, and probably a couple of others as well that we had measured. Um, and those did not seem to make any difference. Of course, there are other things in there that we didn't have good data on, things like smoking, which could have had an impact, and there may be other unmeasured confounders. Um, the, the, the third question was around, did we see any reconversion? So yes, so one of the things I didn't go through is the, the failure rate. So using a failure definition that includes either having to change drugs because of adverse events or to having to uh, change because of failure of uh, conversion or of reconversion, then what we did see was quite a high failure rate and a much lower loss to follow-up rate. So the failure rate is 20% for this regimen, which is quite high and something that we're still looking at. But in terms of reconversion, Actually, most of the cases were failure to convert rather than reconversion, but we did have a couple of cases of reconversion. Um, mm -hmm. Moxifloxacin, we haven't looked in the conventional arm. We're not able to tease out those who got moxi up front versus levo and whether that made a difference. The other question that we have with our results, because the success rate is lower than what's been achieved in some other cohorts, is, is the lower dose of moxifloxacin responsible? Is it that we use capriomycin up front? Is it that there's just higher resistance rates? And we're not able yet to tease that out. You see, before I ask, that is my question. The Convention Bangladesh regimen by Vandion, in this regimen I find moxifloxacin is normal dose and the procinamide is being used in the contribution phase also. So what was the reason for having this change compared to the, uh, to the conventional regimen? Okay, thank you. So the reason we modified the regimen is we were very concerned that 
while we were taking uh, in evidence from Bangladesh, how would it apply in a context where we, ha we knew we had quite a lot of second line drug resistance and we had a high cat gene mutation rate? So the pyrazinamide resistance is between 50 to 70 percent, depending on which year of our cohort we look at. Um, what we decided to do was to put protheonamide throughout the whole regimen. The downside of that, of course, is risk of side effects, which may worsen your results as well with loss to follow-up. I guess the second thing is we chose not to use moxifloxacin at a high dose as recommended by WHO, because at that stage there was actually no data around QT safety. We've got a separate analysis looking at QT safety from this cohort, and what we've seen at one month with the standard dose of moxifloxacin is a, a median of 18 milliseconds of prolongation, so longer than what's been reported for moxifloxacin alone. So there is still some concern that there's not much safety data. In fact, I'm not aware of any safety data of moxifloxacin at high dose combining with clofazamine and risk of QT or torsad. But we didn't see any episodes of torsad or patients having to stop because of prolonged QT. Okay. Next question, please. Somebody at the back row. Already, Already answered. Okay. Yes. After that. Yes, you plus, please. I'm Alan from MSF. Um, I think in many countries we work, there's a higher HIV prevalence. And how do we see the results of this study useful in a place with uh, or are we trying, looking at it in places with a higher HIV prevalence rate? Okay, so there is a study that is ongoing by MSF in Swaziland that is looking at this. Um, I can't tell you the exact numbers. All I can say is that their interim results are showing, showing similar or slightly better results. And the analysis by WHO did tease out a bit on HIV and it shows it seems to be performing the same in HIV. You see, I know this study is very important and there are several hands, but at the same time, Holly is showing me some paper. You know what it shows. So I'm sorry, I'll have to wrap it up here. Thank you so much, Philip. Thank, Thank you. you.